Well, the uh, first thing I want to do is, is thank the people of West Carlton March, those of you who have taken the time to come out here the, this evening and, and discuss the draft 2023 budget. I know that some of you, I, I recognize some of the faces in the crowd and I see some new ones as well. I know that some of you were at uh, the various all candidates meeting and some of you may remember, but, but I'll say it again and I mentioned this in the all candidates meeting in CARP and that's that democracy only works if we play a role in it. And so these conversations are incredibly important uh, in terms of getting feedback and uh, making sure that the, that gets back to the city and the people it needs to because you're the people that, that I came here to listen to tonight and uh, to, to inform the positions that we take as, as leaders in the city and, and building out budgets particularly and how that affects the human beings on the ground and in the ward. So I want to I want to thank all of you and I think you should all be applauded for your uh, dedication to your community and your local democracy. And uh, given that this was my, my very first budget consultation with the public, I was a little bit nervous. I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, I wasn't sure how many people we would get. My main fear was that there would be more city staff here than there were constituents, but we've avoided that. Uh, so I am, I am happy uh, with the turnout, especially with the weather outside and uh, being uh, February. Um, so as I promised throughout the campaign, uh, I will continuously work to increase the opportunities for consultations and, and make sure that there are more people involved in those conversations. Um, so I, I do have some, I was asked by the mayor and uh, some senior leadership at the city of, for feedback on how to, to change the process in terms of consultation and I, I do have some, some feedback that I'll, I'll raise later in this meeting about how to do that that I think will make the process uh, a little more meaningful. Um, so I would also like to take this opportunity to, to introduce you to the Ward 5 team. So these are the people who, who support me every day in my role, and they do the bulk of the work uh, in terms of supporting you when you call or email the office, just in terms of getting, getting the information you need, getting uh, the service requests that you need. So uh, I'm extremely grateful for the team I have, and they've been doing an amazing job um, settling into the office and, uh, and helping constituents. So without further ado, well, actually, before that, I'm going to tell you a little story because some of these names are going to be recognizable to you. Um, we were we were setting up in my office downtown at City Hall, and there's a gentleman coming down the hall on our side of Councillor's Row with a plant. He didn't seem to have a destination. I said, "Can I have that plant?" He said, "Yeah." Comes into the office, puts it down by the window. He paused and he looked up at me and he said, "Is this the office where the staff are more famous than the councillor?" And uh, so some of the names that, that I'm going to introduce you to tonight, uh, you will recognize. So I have uh, Stephanie Lamar, who's my executive assistant. Lisa McGee, who helps with pretty well everything that comes into the office. Uh, Steve Warren, he's my communications guy. If you've ever listened to the Team 1200 over the last 20 years during the morning, you may have heard Steve. Uh, Jennifer Hagerman, also a uh, caseworker and you know, helps me with all kinds of other things like the transportation file. And we got Corey Watt. Anyone who here who's had questions about the vacant unit tax, probably talk to Corey. He's become our uh, resident expert on the vacant unit tax and many other things. So I'd, I'd also like to take the time to introduce the uh, City of Ottawa staff who have taken the time out of their busy schedules to come out to West Carlton tonight and, and help guide the discussion and answer any questions that you might have. So uh, first and foremost, we have our Chief Financial Officer, Seal Rogers. Uh, we have Leslie Van Cleef, who is a uh, coordinator for strategic support. Uh, we have, is Lance Novak here yet? All right, thank you very much for coming out tonight, Lance. Uh, and is that Chad beside you? All right, so they are your vacant unit tax experts. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that piece of housekeeping before I continue so there's no confusion. So this is a budget consultation meeting, but due to the amount of uh, communication that we've received about the vacant unit tax, uh, and there's a great interest in this uh, topic here in West Carlton March, so we decided to bring some experts from the city out who can answer your questions and uh, take some of the feedback that you may or may not have. Uh, we do have with us, I believe, Susan Johns. See you here. Nice to meet you, Susan. Uh, she is the asset management, she runs the director of asset management services, infrastructure and water services. Uh, is there anyone here from Client Services? Is Alan here? No. Okay. Uh, also with us tonight is the uh, Chief, the Ottawa Fire Chief, Paul Hutt. And we have Pierre Poirier, who's the Chief of the Ottawa Paramedic Services. Uh, in terms of the consultation, um, I think it's an, something I talked about during the campaign was making no specific policy uh, promises, which I'm very happy that I did during the campaign. 
Uh, but I did did promise that I would always listen to you and that my positions would be informed for you. And, and while I'll acknowledge that drafting a budget um, and passing a budget during a election year comes with its own challenges, mainly a time constraints, I still believe that this exercise tonight is, is worthwhile. And what we don't get done in 2023, we can look at for 2024. So these opportunities are, are important and meaningful whenever we can have them. So the time constraint uh, has certainly had an influence over the scope of the discussions that I think we're gonna be able to have about the 2023 budget. And there are other factors that have framed these, these consultations and conversations. So we are in very challenging economic times and inflationary pressures are putting, you know, giving us a, a large challenge to deal with as we draft the budget. We have 11 new councillors and a new mayor. So I wouldn't underestimate the challenges that come with that many new councillors and the amount of information that comes our way. And I don't know if anyone has a draft budget with them, but it's about this thick and I, I highly doubt everybody's read every page or totally understands exactly how that happens. And that's why we have Cyril with us here tonight to help with that. Um, and we do have some major challenges across the city. So LRT and transit, homelessness and mental health and addictions, aging infrastructure, including our roads. And as you can see from the lighting in here, right here in this building, we have some aging infrastructure that needs some attention. So, and, and of course we, we can't overestimate the, the pressures that are put on us both economically and, and environmentally with, with climate change. So I think that the pressures on the city are very real. Why did I support these particular budget directions? Given the economic climate we find ourselves in and the pressures we face not only as a city but as individuals and families economically, um, the appetite was to keep the tax increase as low as we possibly could uh, while continuing the current level of service. I didn't think that this was the budget for large sweeping changes. I didn't think this council had enough knowledge or time to really dig in and, and figure out where those changes need to be. Uh, and I was assured by, by city staff that the increase in tax revenue uh, coupled with the, the growth that we've seen in the city of Ottawa tax base would allow us to continue that level of service with a 2.5% increase. We have not even begun to discuss, let alone establish the term of council priorities yet, which I think should guide our budget process along with the plans that the city has in place. Uh, the mayor and several candidates, including me, talked about doing a line by line review and I can already see Ken Holmes smiling about that. Uh, but I think what is more realistic is a universal program review. So that's something that I think most of council is on board with. Uh, even though they talk about line by line review of the budget, I don't think that's what they really mean. I think they mean a wholesome review of, of how the city spends its money, where it's going, what our priorities are. And I think it's been a very long time since the city done, has done that and, and I'm looking forward to doing that. And I think that will help create a more detailed and meaningful conversation for the 2024 budget. So I think if we're going to make large consequential changes that will affect our ward, I want to be very sure that those changes get the attention that they deserve. And uh, during a municipal election year, I just didn't think that that was possible. So that's, those are the reasons that I supported the particular budget directions uh, in 2023. So my, my thoughts on this draft budget. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to, to hear, you know, from, from Cyril, he can explain, you know, how we are able to maintain our current level of service. And, and I know that in going door to door, increasing level of service was, was, was you know, common across every part of this ward, whether it's roads, emergency services, um, other initiatives that people want to see, we're going to have to spend more money. Um, so that'll be a conversation we'll have in the, in the next, next year as, as we build up to the 2024 budget. Um, roads are always a hot topic here in West Carleton. Um, so at a high level, I was pleased to see that the city is spending $136 million to renew our roads. Uh, emergency service was a hot topic during the campaign and it was something I said I would work to improve in the rural areas, particularly in our ward. Uh, so I was, my ears did perk up when I heard that we were hiring 14 additional paramedic staff, uh, as well as 29 new police officers in the city of Ottawa because speeding and, and other issues are and we did, we did meet with the Deputy Chief Bell in this room earlier in this week and heard uh, about the incidents and the increases in, in crime and, and the need for police in our ward. So there are some areas where I, I think that the budget did fall a little short and I'm assuming that that's where the, 
the focus will be tonight with you guys. So even the mayor's promised to spend an additional $100 million on roads over the next four years, that's great. But I still don't believe, and we're still looking into the numbers, and I've got some, some experts helping me with that. Um, I still don't think that gets us to the 2% that I really believe we need to spend, the 2% of our overall road infrastructure each year to keep our roads in good repair. I think our portion of the roads renewal funding, given our vast amount of roads and infrastructure, as well as the historical investments that we've got here in Ward 5, um, we got 2.2 million out of 136. So I, I don't think that's gonna satisfy most residents of Ward 5. And, and as I touched on emergency services, um, that was a topic, you know, rural response times for ambulances, et cetera. And uh, we did receive um, some investments for emergency services, but that's gonna go to new windows in the Kenburn Fire Station, which I don't think will, will help with response times. Mental health and addictions challenges are not exclusive to suburban and urban wards. And they, those are issues that really do exist out here that uh, I didn't see reflected in the draft budget. So, um, as I, as I mentioned, I think what we don't cover here tonight and, and the progress that we want to make in 2023, if we're not able to do that, we can keep that conversation going. We can look to 2024. We're going to do a universal program review. We'll have our priorities set. But I think there will be choices to make. If we want to spend more on roads and we want more emergency services and we want a better level of service and we want our client service center open more than one day a week, where's that money going to come from? Are we going to cut somewhere else or are we going to raise taxes? So I think those are the conversations that we're going to, we're going to be having over the next year. Um, so, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so there's a few housekeeping notes that I'd like to get out of the way. So the vacant unit tax, we're going to save that till the final half an hour, 20 minutes of the session. Uh, I want uh, you guys to inform us on what your priorities are for this budget, what you think we need to improve on, what we can do differently, how can we help you. So that's where I want to focus tonight. I want to hear from you. That is why I'm here. So uh, this session will be recorded and shared online. So if anyone you know who is not able to make it tonight, let them know that they will be able to find it online. They can contact my office, talk to the team here in Ward 5, and we'll be happy to pass on any feedback that, that you have. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to CEO Rogers for his presentation, and then we will open it up uh, to constituents for feedback and uh, your thoughts on the 2023 draft budget. Thank you. Can you guys hear me here or you prefer it on the mic? Good? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. I got it. I prefer to stand and kind of point my hand so you guys can hear me for I'll stay here. So as, as uh, Clark said, we're going to go through a little bit of the high level budget. Stop me at any point. Uh, this is something that we're working on for next year, trying to bring more residential and user friendly. It, it is a Pretty uh, detailed budget, like you said, there's about 100 pages in that document. Uh, there's always a challenge between a low level of detail versus trying to get at a level that you can comprehend at a presidential level. It is complex, so don't be afraid to try to stop me. I'll try and kind of hold in on some areas that I think would be more critical for this area, but I'm trying my best to kind of, kind of break down a little. So again, don't be shy, ask questions if you like, okay? Uh, next slide. So basically every year we develop our, our budget. Uh, for clarity, the budget process doesn't start. We didn't start the budget in December 14 when the council direction was approved. We started the budget well in advance of that. So we're actually already started the preliminary planning for 2024. This is a unique year where we have two budgets in one year. But the true deep dive planning cycle lasts about a good six months. But we actually do a very, we're always living in the budget document, but six months is really where we roll our sleeves and work with everybody we can work on. So it's not a, a four-week exercise or a five-week exercise, it's a very intense exercise that we go through. Uh, the reality is that at a municipal level, we are required to balance our budget. So from a federal, provincial, government perspective, they can run taxes. We can. So we got to make sure that whatever our expenditures are, we have the right revenue dollars coming in to support the expenditures, and we need to take a balance budget. That's, that's legislative and this lack requirements. So every year we go through, we look at our the cost of maintaining our existing services. Uh, we have our unionized environment. About 48, 50% of our budget is compensation related. So it's all tied to effective agreements, negotiating settlement, settlements. So that stays part of our budget. And, and of course, that pays for your, your fire, your paramedics, your role, your operations, et cetera. Uh, we also go through in terms of 
managing growth. So the city is a growing city, continues to grow, so we kind of manage that to, as new infrastructure comes on play, new roles for, for city maintenance, we take that into consideration. And of course, maintain our capital assets, which I'll speak to you a little later. Then of course, we always uh, look at efficiencies. Uh, this budget does have $54 million worth of efficiencies in the budget, so we take those efficiencies, it allows us to keep tax money at a certain balance level, or else we invest in each other of our business as part of shift year to year. Uh, user fees and revenues, so this is mainly where your, your water bill, your recreational fees, uh, any program where you're actually paying for a specific service is covered in that area. And then at the bottom line, very simple, expenditures less than revenues, that's the taxation that we need to collect to balance the budget. Next slide. 2023, 4.5 billion. So it is a large budget, as you can appreciate. Big number. This kind of shows where all that money goes. So, you know, if you take some of the main services, community social services, transit, your water and wastewater, that's probably the bulk of your the budget where it goes there. Obviously, transit is a very capital intensive type of infrastructure service, much like our water and our wastewater program. Uh, you know, about all place at 9%. And then the rest of the service is kind of broken up there. Uh, general government, what is that? That's your finance, your HR, your city clerk, all your administrative functions. That's a very small piece of the, the budget. I'm not saying that because I'm finance. I'm saying that because we are, <laughs> we are a relatively lean administrative organization. Most industry standards, public sector, would see that 10, 15 percent, even more than that. So it is a relatively lean, organ lean administrative uh, organization. Lean. We kind of break it down. Uh, capital formation right here. This is basically what we take from our following your cash account, which we take from your operating and put into your reserves to help fund the from the capital program. Next slide. So where does that four point five billion dollars come from? So over just around fifty percent of this comes from taxes. Uh, payment of taxes, what that is is effectively it is taxes. Uh, the federal government, crown corporations. They don't really receive a tax bill. They receive what we call payment with taxes. It's, it's a legislative thing, but effectively it is a tax bill. And then of course, this is your property taxes right here. So that's about 50% of our income, kind of pay for the costs. Uh, a big chunk comes from federal provincial grants. The majority of that is in your community social services. So your long-term care, child care, uh, various social programs, data from the province, money comes into the province, we administer that, we have all the staff to do that work, and we pull that money out. So limited control, what we can do with that money, we need to go to those programs. Uh, fees and service charges. So this is where you would see if you, you, you rent the ice pad over here, you take swim lessons, you buy for a bus pass, you do any of that kind of comes from a service perspective, your water bill, wastewater, storm at this area really, that's much water. Uh, and then your reserves are a little bit and funds more cash to kind of funds it. Are you taking questions? Uh, Whenever you want to ask a question, yeah. What impact has the changes in the province had in funding the city? I, mean, I understand the city has lost a fair amount of money as a result of some of the things the province has been doing. What is the give it the ballpark? <coughs> so over the years, it's, it varies by program. Uh, you know, a few years back, the Auto public health is funded 75%, 20,000, 75% of the province, 25 from the city. They push that to 70%, 30%, right? So they, the luxury of the upper tier governments is they can push down, but we can't push down. So we're, we're at a little bit So I'll be frank, right? So we have limited ability. This is where the governments grow. So that comes true. Uh, in 2004, government, and again, I'm not, this is not my political opinion, I'm just giving you what we know. Uh, the Ford administration came into play, there was significant change that kind of flowed through from social services programs, reductions. Uh, you know, right now, legislation Bill 23 in terms of poor housing and those things are, you know, there's lots of media out around that. This is not my opinion, this is being factual. There are some significant impacts flowing through those kind of things that ultimately comes down to this well. So I, there's also the loss of developer fees, right? So that's going to have about a hundred and thirty million dollar a year impact on the city of budget. Uh, it could be as much as sixty million a year, so we're, we're four years. So yeah. So I, I remember this came up at one of our council meetings, and uh, the one 
one of the councillors asked how much our property taxes would need to go up on average to cover that 130 million, it's about 3%. So. Yeah, that's not until 2024 though, if I understand that correctly. So right, right now that bill has been kind of push out, push out, you know, the, the provincial commitment again, we're not going to put political opinions, they're supposed to be as a whole for 2023. Uh, so that's still being debated. Most of us probably are advocating against that bill or are kind of at the top of this bill right now. So in our 2023 budget, there's no impacts reflected, uh, but it could start to trickle in 2023 as it goes through. It's just to clarify that out of the high of fees, services, and charges that come out, the 60 million? Sorry, say that again. The 60 million that, that you said annually could be as high as for uh, Bill 23. Yeah. Would that be coming out of the no, fees? I'll get that in a second where that would come from. Oh, okay. Is that going to impact the budget 2023? I'll show you in a second where it would be. Okay. Okay. Good. Next slide. Uh, so, capital. So, within our budget, we do have a billion dollar capital program, which is. Sorry. Sorry, uh, okay. just on the previous slide, uh, there was a section for reserves, something like 170 million dollars. Yeah. Is that the gap that we had to pull from reserves because we didn't have enough revenue, or there's certain uh, there's certain funding that we all need each year from our reserves? Okay. Is that a flaw? Is that a balancing act? Okay. Basically, what we require to get into the cash into the program. Okay. Uh, cap. Oh, there we go. Capital program. So a billion dollars. Uh, the bulk of the capital is spent in two main areas, uh, your drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, and your integrated roads and water and wastewater. What integrated roads means, so you can correct me if I say anything wrong, but basically if we need to replace a pipe, the pipe is under the road, so we, we do the road at the same time as we do the pipe, so we don't do the pipe this year, we'll next year, it makes sense to do it together. So we call that integrated. So part of that funding is coming from your rates and your water bills and your wastewater bills, but there's also a tax component for your property tax because your property tax pays for the road infrastructure. But it makes sense. Uh, obviously, transit is a big ticket item, not so much in this area, but you know, we do have a lot of bus fleets, bike rail, that capital program right there. Uh, transportation, that's where you would see your, your roads resurfacing budget, very in that number. Okay, next slide. So, how do we pay for that? So, this is basically Money we take out of our reserves, so that's, that's cash. So basically, we're taking money out of our bank account and paying for that that, uh, that program. Uh, debt, we do leverage debt, so debt is like a mortgage. So in the city, we do have, uh, there's provincial legislation where city debt for tax supported assets needs to be at 25%. This council put that number at 7.5%, and our actual debt rate is below 12 percent What does that mean? That means that we're very, Fiscally strong, very fiscally prudent organization because our debt is at a low level from the tax servicing perspective. Again, 25% provincial level, 75 is council level, we're actually below 4%. So it's a pretty strong uh, indicator of how, how tight we are on our money and investments. Uh, we do have a AAA and a AA rating from credit agencies, which is a very strong rating that helps to do investments and issue bonds in the market, which we have money and return on as we pay for those assets. Uh, development charges, so this is where you would see the impact of Bill 23 down the road. So there's no impact reflected here, uh, but this is basically when a developer builds a house, pays for the permit, that only reflects that fee, that development charge, that goes in this bucket right here. So that's where you would see ultimately, you know, one scenario would be if Bill 23 goes forward, development charges go down, this guy is going to shrink, and then we got to figure out how do we expand on the other ones. So if the profits don't fill the gap, we have a gap to figure out, or we don't spend as much in terms of infrastructure, which doesn't pay any money. So. Is, it, is this how you're accounting for reserve? You're, it says reserve 62.6%. So that mean for your capital fund for this one year, you're taking 62% of your reserve? Uh, or does that mean 60? How much of the reserve does that? Truck, uh, so basically, the 62% is basically $660 or million dollars out of the 1.2 is what we're taking in reserves. So 62% of the total 1 billion. It's not 62% coming out of our reserves. 
Sorry, what was the percentage last year? Just what uh, comparison have been doing? Now you're testing me. Uh, normally, normally I does suck that around 15 to 65 percent. Uh, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but that's normal. So it's high, but not unusual then? No, it's not at all. So if you look at, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think, our transitional report, which is part of the piece of budget documents, we do have a opening balance of all our reserves. So at the beginning of 2023, our projected numbers are around 595 million. We are coming down to 540 million by the end of 2023. It's not because we're taking more money out. It's just the nature of the rain, two things. The nature of the rain program, that rain infrastructure is very peaks and valleys. It's very expensive. So it goes up some years, it goes down some years. So 2023 is a heavier capital intensive for, for the rain program. In addition, in 2021 and 2022, during the pandemic, we, we paused a lot of spending. We, we held back a lot of capital programs as a mitigation strategy, just in case provincial funding didn't come through for all the pandemic impacts, lost revenues in the city. We were made whole, so now all that money is going back out, so all the programs are back in, in, in production, if you will. Thank you. The development charges, if we were to look at that over, say, a 10 year period, would that have changed in terms of the amount that came into the coffers? Like right now, would it be like 10% more than it was 10 years ago? Would it be 10% less? I would have the percentage off the top of my head of definitely increasing. Uh, again, because the city is growing and expanding. Uh, one of the things that I'm not sure if I speak to here, but uh, Clark mentioned the assessment growth. So in 2023, our assessment growth, basically our assessment growth is, is any new house that's going to pay property taxes in 2023, that didn't exist in 2022. So if your house was, you know, if you moved into your house December 31st, you didn't pay a tax bill in 2022, but now you're going to pay a tax bill in 2023. So the assessment growth for 2023 is 2.2%. Normally we're around at 1.5, 1.6%. So we've seen a good, this is the highest assessment growth we've seen. And that would be indicative of if we were to go back through historical development charges, you would see a trend of increasing development charges based on the latest growth. Just to get the lead with that, um, how, what are the infrastructure on ongoing costs compared to the development fees that we collect? So we, we get, you know, a thousand dollars, whatever, per house. How much does it cost in ongoing infrastructure costs, wastewater, road, uh, clearing, all that stuff? Do we are we in a cycle where we have to constantly develop to pay for last year's developments, snow clearing, garbage, sewers, all that stuff? So just to make sure we separate a couple of things. So yeah. development charges, the theory is growth pays for growth. Again, that can be paid. Uh, so basically what that means is the growth development charges should pay for the infrastructure to put that growth in. The development charge mechanism is very complex, so I'll try and keep that in the right level so I don't run out of those. So basically, if, if we were to put a subdivision across the street right here, they're not going to pay 100% of the total infrastructure there because there's a benefit for this role right here on the input. So the development charges should cover the incremental cost of the infrastructure that subdivision. It's not always a one one relationship. So the snow plow comes down, now we get going to do another fine or a wing, right? So there's a breaking point where we watch that in terms of how that growth, assessment growth is applied to those services. Much like fire and paramedic, because they're here on the ground, just because we put a new border home in there doesn't necessarily mean you need one more paramedic, one more fire. So it is, comes into play, but we look at other metrics in terms of service delivery, service standards, to kind of help with that. It's, so it's harder on the operating side for units versus the capital side a little bit easier, if that answers your question. I guess this was a, a point that I brought up in one of the debates was the intensification or the, uh, the urban sprawl that we're facing a lot of. We're eventually going to run out of space in Ottawa. Are we going to be able to pay for the bill if we cannot develop anymore? That's, I guess, the reason. Yeah, I mean, that, that's theoretical. I mean, in, in my life, I think not as lots of land, but uh, I 
at some point in time, there's some investigation and, and this fraud. There's a clear policy on that, but it's not my job to give my opinion on that. So, is there a standard formula you use when determining how much of that growth is going to actually add to the city coffers versus? expenses to service that area? Like, I, I know there's 2.2% growth. Is that an assumption we've made based on a standard formula, or do you look at where that growth is particularly and how that will affect the city budget? So, maybe I'll try it this way. The complexities of that a true standard is, is just a mathematical equation. So, you know, when our operation is easy to break down because, you know, it all depends on some. Right. Last year, uh, in 2022, we had a good winter season in the front half and the second half. Uh, this year, I think already we received more snow in January than we received all last year. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't allocate more money to roads if the last two, three years there are surpluses. That leads to inefficiencies. So we look at different things. We look at obviously the growth component, but we also look at you know the other variables such as what mother nature. So we kind of look at different services. On the buyer service, is obviously a little different because we're looking at the cost of service. Obviously, kind of makes it a different situation these days, one of zeros. But we also look at different service or metrics that we have for each service at the city. Kind of compare that to the growth as well. Next slide. Uh, expenditure discretion. So this basically kind of highlights what discretion that we can do with our budget. So we, we really have limited flexibility in terms of taking money from Peter and giving it to Paul, if you will. And, and what I mean by that is non-discretionary, so these are basically all provincial legislative type programs that are typically tied to legislative funding of some sort, so we can't really touch that because it's, it's prescriptive. When we look at police, we have limited, the city of Ottawa has limited input on the police budget. They're governed by the Police Services Act, which is governed by the Police Services Board. So they have, the city itself has a little bit of control over what that fund goes for. When you look at programs and service standards, again, if you take a dollar away from fire, that means they have less firemen, fire women on the street. So that's tied to a service. As soon as you take money under the program with a service standard, you're obviously either taking money away, you're taking service away. Uh, direct services such as library and recreational facilities, again, very much driven by, you know, if you take money away from the recreational program, you can't do swim lessons, so you can't go do that program. Which leads you right back to the support services, again, not because of finance, very low number, 5.4%. If you want to take, take some money away from there, you lose me here tonight. That's nice. <laughs> What does it mean then if when the council says that they want to take a climate lens when they look at all of these various components of the budget? So the climate, the climate, climate master plan strategy report is a very big visionary report. Uh, obviously from the city of Ottawa as an organization perspective, some of the big things that we, we can do better in terms of contributing to GHG emissions and reductions is obviously the biggest thing is, is transit. You can debate, you know, electric buses versus diesel bus. Obviously, the emissions is more, is out there on the electric side. Uh, light rail system, much more, you know, climate friendly, if you will. And when you look across other fleet within the organization, we try and use hybrid or electric vehicles where it makes sense. Uh, so from a internal organization perspective, transit is our best investment from a climate change perspective, but all these other little things that we do, uh, the city can earn 50,000 uh, street lights to LED, very much more energy efficient, less carbon impact. Uh, but that master plan is very global. That plan also speaks to the requirement for provincial and federal investments. Uh, the city of Ottawa will have to solve the city of Ottawa climate change issues. The city of Ottawa can invest in the city of Ottawa as an organization to do better, but we also have to advocate for provincial federal partners as we move forward with climate change. Is that kind of nice too? Uh, next slide. 
Uh, budget directions, Clark mentions uh, support of this. So basically, December 14, uh, we have approval to proceed with a 2.5% tax levy increase. Uh, there is three different levies on the tax bill one for police, one for transit, one for citywide services. Uh, we also have the assessment growth, which I spoke to, at 2.2%, rate program overall increase of 4.2%, and then the user fees and the capital budget based on the program. So, what I would say is, me and my team, what we're responsible for doing is we're responsible for delivery of the document endorsed and directed by the council. I do not choose how much money goes to the roads budget, I do not choose how much money goes to this board versus that board. What I do is I use all these reports to make sure that we meet our commitments as directed by council. We build that up and it comes up and that's what it's debated. So from a roads infrastructure perspective, we're investing into the roads program to close the infrastructure gap. I'm worried about the question a little bit, I'm sure, uh, and we're around that gap, but that's what we do in terms of filling that gap. Uh, a little bit of a calendar. So basically, directions report was tabled on December 7th, approved on December 14th. Now we're into the consultation process starting in January to start the rest of the month of February. Uh, February is a jam packed month of committee meetings, which you can probably jump in the slide to see the magnitude. So these are all the committee meetings. Uh, today was day one, so finance and, uh, finance and corporate services is a new committee. Uh, that was the first meeting today, and as you can see, the next three weeks was filled with pretty much back-to-back -back, uh, committee days. That's where the public can come out to your delegation, uh, to provide input in terms of specific items within that committee. Uh, so the different committees, each budget is broken down by committee, so the budget will got committee budgets. Each budget goes to committee, debated, if approved, that buys the council on March 1st, and on March 1st, it's really adopted, and then we jump right into 2024 process. Uh, resources for input. Uh, these sessions, uh, I always point to the answer. Uh, again, just because the budget is deep dive budget right now, it doesn't mean you can't be talking to your counselor about 2024. It really is a living document, it's a living process. Input is always, you know, the counselor is the best, best uh, point of contact. During budget season, we do obviously put up other tools uh, in terms of engage Ottawa, Ottawa.ca, different media things. Uh, this year, the budget, and we've added a few different things in terms of trying to make the budget a little bit more digestible and understandable. We're going to play on that and improve that. Uh, we're hoping to do a little bit of a better consultation for next year in 2024. Uh, what's the priority of the council spoke to is the strategic priorities. So, the strategic priority process will begin shortly after March, March 1st, and that really is going to better document to start moving forward for the next terms of the next three years of the budget that we go through. So, that's it for the presentation. So, I think one thing that you really have to do a lot more thorough job on is interpreting budget in terms that people can understand. Yeah. Like there's so many aspects of this that, you know, especially out here in Ward 5. Where it's a real award, we don't pay a transit levy, but obviously our tax dollars and other forms go into the transit system. If you think of the roads budget, we, we got not even 2% of the money for roads this year, but what percentage of the roads do we have? It's easier to understand those kinds of things if somebody's explained it. And there's a, you don't want to give political opinions, but it's difficult for us to express ours to the provincial authority. We don't understand things like the impact of removing the um, developer fees. Yeah, that's a good point. Could you just can you summarize what he just said? Because I'm pretty close to it, but I couldn't understand a darn thing. So, so basically, the, the credit <coughs> the key is really making that document more understandable at this level, right? Okay. And okay. I agree about the very comment that came up last night in, in another consultation. And there's a fine that I'm not in, you know, debate or the reality is. There's a fine level of detail in that big book. There's a lot of detail, but now the job is on me and my team to kind of spin that in a way where it is more user friendly. So it's a takeaway that we're working on. Uh, in this budget, there is a budget guide document. It helps a little bit, but I agree it's still very complex. Obviously, I didn't read it, so I can go through the book and kind of pinpoint to it. But it's something that we have as a takeaway. If I, were, if I can suggest something for you, maybe 
create something we kind of raise the priority, right? As we pull into the term, term accounts and priorities. That way it gets more support. Again, what I do is I basically I don't get involved in politics, I do council directs and change policies. So if you can try to make that part of the priority, it helps push that along in terms of getting that. I think with eleven new councillors struggling to understand a <laughs> however many page book that is, then yeah. we'll be able to uh, and, and the intent the intent is not to make it overwhelming or here you go, but then we walk away, right? If you have questions, email us, we always be back again. Right. But I said the last thing, say exactly the same thing to the staff last year. And that was because they, they were saying, okay, so now's the point. I can't really do much about this one, but now's the time to start working on the next one. And I said to them, then give us some information to work with. Nothing. So that's what we need. If we're going to be involved in planning the next one, we have to understand this one. So, you know, obviously we may not get that information before this is finalized and approved by the council, but the next week, the next month, it's still important to get that breakdown and that analysis so we can work with it to help the councilor get what we need. Unfortunately, I can't even to spend that magic overnight. And I don't mean to be whatever, but the reality is going to be a takeaway. We'll make steps to improve it. Again, not to be defensive, but the, we do have a budget guide this year, which is the first time, which is a good thing. And we'll work on the rebadging over. So, point taken. One of the things that I think would be useful in communicating budget is um, the trade-offs. Like the council set to 2.5% uh, increase. What does that mean in terms of program choices? What are we losing if we don't go to 3% or 25 So some idea as to you know, what, the, what the cost benefits of uh, some of these things are. It sort of helps you orient yourself to the, to the overall plan. So, so what you might even say is this budget does not have any service cuts. To your point, you know, what would one percent be more of? Uh one percent basically generates an increase of twenty million dollars. So if we were to come up with an additional one percent tax increase, I gave you about twenty million dollars. So you know twenty million dollars would go a long way depending on where it where it goes. Just as a measure, as an example. Take some over here first, or no? Okay. All right, so to follow up then, uh, if Bill 23 goes through $60 million a year, we could be looking at an additional 3% to make up that shortfall? You can use straight math. So yeah. basically, there's a couple of things that, you know. I'm simplified off. Yeah, I agree. I'm just saying, you know, don't go and start saying city state goals. No, 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 no. So basically, <laughs> <laughs> you know, keep it, keep it contextual, right? So yeah. the reality is, it could be as much as. Right? So we're still trying to untangle Bill 23, right? What does that mean? At the end of the day, we also have updated our, our PC background, which is updated in 2024. So there's a lot of moving parts in the air, but yes, at a very simple level, 1%, 20 million, 60 to 60 million, 3%. But then also another two and a half, which is the norm on like, increasing. So it yeah. be a five and a half. Okay, to add to that then, should Bill uh, 23 go for, is the fiscal year April 1st to March 1st? Is that how you run the budget? For, for, for us at the city, we're calendar year. Oh, okay. okay. The province and the feds are the April 1st to March 1st. So, Bill 23 comes in 2024, it, does, it should impact this budget then? That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Just, uh, just on the communication stuff. Something that's hard not to get into the weeds and, and like you're very high level and it's good stuff. But you don't tell us what you're doing this year. Well, well, I, I, can't, I can't take uh, the, the $4 billion and say you want to take uh, X number of new buildings or. I, got, I don't know, not to go down into the weeds, but. We get the dollars here, the dollars coming in, the dollars going out, and where they're going in the front picture. But I don't know what to do. So what I can say is, is if you do look at the budget book, we go down to the service area, which is a very low level. So you would look, you can go to the transportation committee, go to the roads section, and you'll see in there uh, the roads budget is around again about 110 million. So that's what we that's what we're spending on roads maintenance. That takes care of your winter operations, your potholes, your guardrails, your ditching, your, your side gravel roads. If you go into the capital section of the budget book, you go down to your road resurfacing program, you're going to see $74 million. You're going to see a list of roads that $74 million is going to be allocated. So it does go into pretty good detail. 
You go to the fire, you go to uh, EPS, which is the community this year, the Emergency Protective Services. You go to the fire budget, you will see the total fire budget, you will see the total number of FTEs for fire, you'll see a second one for paramedic, you'll see a second one for, for bylaw. So again, it is all there in detail, it's overwhelming, but it's just a matter of, you know, whether it's someone like me coming out more often or, or putting the calls in, understand where to go. But the detail is there. I realize that, I've gone through it before, not this one, but I've gone through it before, and it's quite painful. But um, some of the bigger stuff for the ward, okay, not, not, not the details, but like how many new arenas are we going to get this year? Uh, Zero. The stuff that, that people are here that yeah. might be interested in, you know, some things that I can see or. or Get my head around and how much it's going to cost on you know, the budget for that. That's sure. I mean, I that's 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 interesting. Sorry, Jim. Um, so the ward summaries, which every councillor received a ward summary of the new investments in their ward, is that public? Like our our So I don't put those together in my team. Okay. Uh, I don't see why not. Sure. And, and am, am I allowed to share that? So we can, I will share that um, with the public. I'll put out the award summary so everybody can see exactly the additional investments that are being made in Ward 5 this year. Can we maybe, do we, do we have a digital copy we can throw up? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> My my thought is that uh, uh, about a couple of years ago, we're on our, my street was off William Mooney, and they put a, a, a circus treatment on that. Boy, is it ever good! And I, I guess if if I if somebody lives outside of that area, I'm sure they'd like to have the same kind of road. From my perspective, if I have to pay two point uh, sorry, three percent rather than two point five percent. I I think it's worth doing that. So pass that along to the councillor and to the. But I know there's a, a political objective to try and get the two point five percent, as long as it doesn't mean that in the list of stuff that you're going to do, you put off too many roads too long too far. You know I know roads aren't sacred downtown, but here they mean a lot to people getting around and, and uh, when when they eventually got to doing William Meteor Road, it was in tough, tough shape and you know you had to weave and bump. so you shouldn't let things go that far down the handle and I guess I chip in my two, I chip in my three percent and I'm not here to complain but my bill to the town uh, to the city is nine thousand dollars a month so what so I, I'm saying I got a little skin in the game but it's 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 worth. I think we get pretty good services out of the what, what happens. Uh, and somebody asked about uh, what's the city doing that or, um, you know trying to eco friendly. They loan me enough money, put solar panels on my roof. I don't. I pay it back with no interest over twenty years. I don't know who made that decision. And when I start pulling the snow off, I'm not sure it was a good decision. But anyway, it, that's the kind of thing the city is trying. And I'm. I'm Pleased to see they're at least trying to do things like that. So, congratulations on that. Thank you. Susan, did you want to comment at all on the road aspect of that? Like how things are prioritized? And sure. Um, my team's got, uh, we've got 100 people in asset management who work pretty well the bulk of the year checking on all of the infrastructure. I want to say checking on is the condition of all of our infrastructure. So, the city's got about Seventy billion dollars worth of infrastructure is the estimate that we did last year. And so that's all our buildings and parks, the big water treatment plants, um, all of our roads, water mains, and every kind of sewer that there is, including ditches and stuff like that. So we've got a we've got a specialized team that looks at bridges. We've got a road team, everybody, and we do a certain number of very detailed engineering assessments on a very regular basis. Um, depending on a whole bunch of factors. So we've got a team and it's the same two guys that do the road drive through the nice weather to look at 
that's my condition, and it's the same set of eyes that are evaluating things. Um, there's five or six criteria. Um, the traffic volume that's on the road is one of the factors. The surface ride that those guys, the drivability, how smooth is it? What the composition of the asphalt is and whether it is keeping water out, like how much cracking or alligatoring or crossover, that kind of thing. So the surface integrity. The soil underneath the road is a factor. So we do geotechnical tests to collect information because that helps figure out what the black should be based on what the soils are. And uh, so all of that, the road would come up with a certain score of how poor it is. And this is citywide. So our allocation of the money for roads that we, that we get every year from the Long Beach Financial Plan, um, from Cyril Shaw, here's how much you get for roads. We look citywide, and there's a evaluation that happens. And then in, uh, in the city area, any road that's, which here we're talking about integrated, there's other stuff going on with the road in terms of the pipes underneath or the activity that's going on with development. There's a lot of coordination things. And in every area, there's also uh, traffic considerations. So there's sort of, the road gets a score, what else is going on, could we coordinate with and make sure we get the best bang for the buck, um, and what other traffic considerations there would be. And we come up with a road, a list that's based on the priority of need, of how crappy is it equally as the city. <laughs> and that, that really is, I really appreciate your comments about how bad it was before that happened, and that is a universal across the city sentiment of photos that we get and look how terrible this is, and we're like, oh, but you should see this one, because they are evaluating all across. Um, so that's the list that's in the budget has all of that work behind it um, to say this is the best return on our investment. We should do this one sooner, because if it goes longer, we're going to have to fully replace it instead of just sealing the cracks or instead of doing a, a different type of treatment. And in the rural area, we have different kinds of things that we can do, right? Road preservation and chip and tar and stuff like that. Could I just put a word in on behalf of the surface treated roads? Our area was really checked when they didn't pay that they put on surface street. But boy, it stood up well, at least for three years. <laughs> uh, but you can prove twice as much of, of that yes. as you can on a paved road. So I hope people will be a bit compassionate or understanding if they get, if they get a certain uh, paved road. I mean, I mean, do you even add ad spot? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I need to interrupt the, the natural flow of things, and I know everyone wants to talk more about roads, and so do I. But I am aware of the time. Mr. Poirier is the head of the paramedic services, has to leave at 20 minutes after 8. So I just wanted to see, and I know it's an important topic, certainly for me. Uh, but if anyone can start, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, I'll just, I want to make sure that he didn't come here for no reason. So if anyone has any questions about uh, ambulance services or paramedics or how we service the rural areas and what those challenges are, uh, I would invite you to direct your uh, questions to Mr. Poirier at this time so that we can uh, free him up to leave when he needs to. How much does the province pay of the, of, uh, the paramedic service there? Uh, the total budget for next year is about 130 million for the current service. And that's half and half, right? And about 62 million, give or take, it comes from the province. So on the ambulance side, we call it land ambulance, uh, they take 50% uh, of our budget. And then on the communication side, because we operate the communication center, which is in Ontario, they pay 100%. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the, the process works in terms of finances. So the total budget for what the city pays is around 54 or 56 million out of the 130. And is there any progress on trying to get the, it seems to be awful use of abuse or use of, misuse of service, have four or five ambulances waiting to have somebody in the hospital treat them. But if you can, if somehow they could fund one paramedic to look after five or six people there and get, get back on the, uh, providing service to people. And we are doing that. We have about four different programs. Uh, we get two and a half million dollars a year <coughs> uh, to actually fund the hospitals to hire extra nurses specifically to take paramedic uh, patients. Uh, we also place paramedics specifically at the hospitals 
ourselves. Uh, so that, you know, if we have four paramedic crews there, we'll send a paramedic, one single paramedic, and he'll take care of four patients. That's so that would be four crews. And then specifically at the Montfort Hospital, we actually have another service where we have a paramedic working in the emergency department who's part of the emergency team who has full scope of practice and takes up the floor of our patients as well. So we keep on working on different programs to remove or get those paramedics back on the road. Uh, and that is funded by the province uh, directly. So the city or tax base is funding those that initiative. When uh, we used to have an ambulance in Carp, in the village, when they got the ambulances, it wouldn't fit in the fire station anymore. They couldn't adjust because of the land and they couldn't expand the fire station, so we lost our ambulance. The service response times have never been anywhere near what they were when we had them. Uh, it's not that our ambulance didn't fit in the bay. <laughs> uh, it had to do with new, uh, new pump that came to Carp, and they didn't have room for us in there. So we moved to Riddell. Right. So we're down the road, uh, what, is that six kilometers? I'm not sure exactly how far it is, but we're down uh, at Dunrobin Road in March Road. Uh, it has affected our response time, yes. Because uh, I, I checked when it happened, and I had, we requested the, the information from us last year, and it's nowhere near where it was. The, so the difficult part for us is that all through the pandemic, our response times all went to uh, we've had a very difficult time with all our response times, so that's kind of accentuated how difficult that's been, uh, even more so. Um, so that's where you know the, the addition of 14 new staff this year should help, uh, and hopefully, I'm optimistic that it should help, with, particularly with rural areas, not just West Carlton, but also North Core and Mount Austin. Because uh, we're, we're the largest small community within the city that doesn't have its own ambulance station. Uh, Possibly, yeah. And something you talked to the council is. The work you do with uh, paramedics, is that a net change from the previous year? Correct. Or is that back around retirements or? No, like that's that? a net new. So like last year we got 14 new paramedics. We actually hired 52 staff. Oh, okay. Because of retirements, uh, uh, separate programming funds that came from the province, those elements. Uh, and some people who left. So I think we had 15 people leave. Uh, new programming was about 20 and then 14 new. And so it ended up at 52. But it was 14 net new, and that will be the same next year. How long does that get vehicles? Uh, yes, we get two vehicles and the operator dollars to support the operation of those two vehicles. Just wanted to clarify when you talk about paramedic staff. Because that's the language that's used in the budget. Sure. 14 additional paramedic staff. Does that mean 14 people who can get in an ambulance and respond to a 911 call? Or does that include administrative positions <coughs> or, or other positions within the paramedic service? It year to year changes. And uh, so I think last year it was, I think, 12 or 13. And then a supervisor or a superintendent who actually also works on the road and is able to respond. So there is that mix. I think this year might be 11 or 12, and one person to support the back office. And I mean back office, I mean uh, paramedics don't stock and clean their vehicles. We have a separate uh, staff that do that to speed that process so that the paramedic spends more time on the road and not stopping your vehicle. So we, uh, I think they have an inclusion of hiring one of those staff as well. So that's why that number of changes. That's very substantive. How, uh, how far then will an additional 14 staff go towards correcting or solving some of the, some of the problems that you've been experiencing? Um, so that's the very good question. Because when uh, the council spoke about term council, uh, that's where we have a duty, and that's part of our process and our work right now, is we're going to be bringing a report to council to actually provide all the metrics and all the data about where we're at what our metrics are, and then what is our need going forward. This year, the 14 was kind of a continuation of what we've done over the last number of years, trying to keep up just with growth. And just to give you an idea, our call volume last year went from uh, overall from 146,000 responses to about 166,000 responses. So that growth got sucked up, no problem, and we're actually behind. 
I don't know how we are behind, but that'll be part of our homework that we're doing right now. Uh, are there any specific plans for Board 5 or with that? And I say that because in the last 14 months, I've used ambulances three times. Two from our prior and one from Renfrew. So there's a couple of things here. One is that, and you're, you're very much aware of that, it's called a seamless service in the uh, province. So the reason that we get 50% funding and Renfrew gets 50% funding is that the province recognizes that if we need help, the car from our prior is going to come to Kinder Murder Lab. Right? That, that's kind of how the system works. And there's times when we go to Carlton Place in Almond or to Rockland. So that's kind of the idea in terms of the seamlessness. That's why the 50 50 cost shift. In terms of stuff that's specific to this community, for the last several years, uh, we've been getting specific funding, about I think less than $200,000, to have a paramedic assigned to the West Carlton Family Health Team. So that's something that's specific to this community, West Carlton. It's the only area in the city that has it. So that's one of the examples of a paramedic who's specifically dedicated to do work in this community. How does that work? Like they're part of the center in Carlton? Correct. Yeah. But that's, that's only you have to be a patient there to take advantage of their service. Yes. Uh, that's part of the, the process, but there are outreach pieces that we have. So one of the, and I don't want to consume, I can talk for hours on this, but right, what excites me is about the number of calls that we're getting isn't going, isn't going to get old. It's how we're going to deal with them so that we don't get stuck in hot hospital delays. So one of the ways we do it is we get specific funding for community paramedics. So right now we have uh, 35 paramedics that are funded 100% by the province or by long-term care or ministry of health, different agencies that take care of all 5,000 patients in the community. So there's probably there's some in Carp, uh, there's some in the neighborhood around here that a paramedic actually goes to help somebody stay at home while they're waiting for a long-term care facility or somebody who needs uh, follow-up care after they leave the Queen's Way of Carlton Hospital. So those are kind of the ideas where I'm trying to avoid that next call for service or that next transport to the hospital. So that's kind of the exciting part of my job. But... Has there been any discussion to meet your demand uh, when we talk about utilizing other services and, and revisiting your tiered response model? Uh, actually, we're in the process. Uh, uh, Paul and I are visiting the the tier response. Uh, we've had several meetings. Uh, the last, it was the whole model of when police go, when fire goes, when and who calls who to help. Uh, it was done in 2013-14. We're in the process of renewing it right now. We've already made some tweaks, and uh, Paul and I and the police uh, service are very much engaged in that discussion. Would that be something we would see in the 2023 fiscal year? I think very much so. We've already kind of we've adjusted the terms of reference. Uh, Paul and I are on the same page for most things. Uh, we are able to some things, but uh, no, I think it's a very positive move. Thank you. We're still losing a lot of our paramed uh, resources in the parking lot of the emergency uh, room. What's the likelihood of getting any more funding from the province to, uh, to offset that inefficiency? Um, well, I'll tell you that. Uh, when I said that number that's funded by the province, on the 7.3, we've got an additional million dollars from now to the end of March to add to more staff within the hospital. So that's in addition to 2.5? Well, that's in addition to 1.5. Oh. So I'm hoping we'll get another 2.5 come April 1st uh, to continue that program. The good part is, uh, you know, uh, we used to always blame hospitals for all this problem. For 20 years, that's what we're doing. We're trying to change the focus and say, it's a healthcare system problem. How can we work together to solve it or do we better? So, so obviously the, the number is how much value you'll get by putting a couple million dollars into the, the hospital waiting line. Uh, yeah, I haven't quantified it. I'm, I, there is value, absolutely. So based on your, your last annual report, yeah. the, the numbers show there's a, a tremendous return to the city Correct. for every dollar that the province can put in. Yeah, and we can still do that. Yeah, that's kind of, the idea is right now it's one to four. 
but actually I'd like to get the one to or have three staff there to take care of all of them. Because it's not uncommon for somebody to drive by to sit at hospital and see uh, 10, 15 ambulances waiting. But the province could provide the money directly to the hospital, not having to go to the city. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why they've done that. I don't know the politics behind why they decided to give us the money to give to the hospital to buy the service. I think partly my my you know, my thought is they don't want the hospital to spend it somewhere else. That's just my thought. Thank you. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. Have you been able to more or less eliminate these times when there are no ambulances available to service people? What how many incidents of that have you seen recently with, with all your new uh, uh, innovations and extra money? So uh these are tough parts that last year was a really difficult year. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't want to shock you, but uh, I think we had seventy-four thousand minutes of level zero, which means there was not an ambulance available to transfer. Um, How many months from the so? 74,000 minutes, I equated that for four months. Essentially, two months. Yeah, when you calculate all the minutes, how that equals to go. This year, uh, in the last month, we're about a third of what we were on a monthly basis last year. So there's been significant improvement. And that truly is as a result of maybe not the efficiencies you've created, but that COVID is on a little bit of a downside right now. Good. I'm glad but it is, it's a lot of work to do. Yes, it's still not there. And I won't go sugar it. Uh, that's what keeps me up at night. So, no, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, thank you. sir. I appreciate the opportunity to have a couple minutes, and uh, I apologize for messing up the agenda. No, you <laughs> <laughs> can sit down for the break. We don't need a break. Yeah, I just want to comment. Um, I'm too involved in. In our our of course West Carlton in terms of the uh, uh, our Park Regional Health, and I have to say that the work of the paramedics has been fantastic in terms of picking up, as you said, this community initiative. There's a paramedic in the hospital because we're short of staff, picking up and carrying on. So their contribution is much broader than simply having ambulances available. They're involved in the community. They're supporting the community. They're part of integrating the larger health system. And it's made a difference, I think, too, also in the need to go into the emergency and use the ambulance. So I have to congratulate you on that and the direction of the state. Get this way these days. Thank you for the comment. Uh, that's actually my tutor, uh, Mike Nolan, in, uh, yes. in Redford. Yeah. Uh, good friend. Uh, we we'll work together. But just to give you an idea of how important that was, and my yeah. help is here. Uh, our Alma Carlton Place. Kentville, Winchester, uh, Alexandria, and Hawksburg. All those hospitals closed at some point. And it's been a horrendous for us as well. Because what happens when those are closed, they end up in the city, jet, a bad, a back in the city, and we end up having to bear the brunt of that too. Our prior didn't close, and the only reason was is because the Great for Paramedic Service has been staffing that emergency for the last uh, 10 months, every day, basically. Well, so, sure. well, credit to them and credit to uh, them helping out their community. Really, really important. So, I can't take credit for what they've done, but uh, I think that's really an important piece. Thank you again for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have more to share with her? No, just you at the end. Okay, well, I, I am aware. So, these gentlemen have been waiting patiently to do their big unit tax presentation and take any questions that you guys have on that. So, um, conscious of the time, I, I want to make sure that they're able to make the presentation and take any questions. So why don't we go to that, and then if there's more comments or questions specifically for the 2023 draft budget, we can get to it after that. Does anyone have any specific questions they want to ask the fire chief? He's really a nice guy. Introduce yourself. This is Ned. My name is Al Paul. I am the fire chief. Uh, Bill Bell is your second chief to you. You might uh, know who Bill is. Uh, he's in Vancouver, I think, now. Uh, I'd love to be with him. But, uh, 
Um, you know, maybe what I'll do is I'll just take two minutes since I have the floor. Councillor, thanks very much for the invitation tonight. Uh, at City of Ottawa is so unique. Uh, very privileged to be the fire chief of the Ottawa. We're the largest composite fire service, when we say composite fire service, of a hybrid model. And, uh, and I, honestly, um, you are extremely, and again, biased, but extremely fortunate to have the, uh, the, the true uh, volunteers in your community, day in and day out, that respond to emergencies that you do uh, in your community. So, uh, um, but uh, just to keep things into perspective, uh, on the career side, on the urban side, there's uh, there's a thousand full-time firefighters, and on the volunteer side, there's 500 volunteers that represent uh, probably 80% of the land mass within the city of Ottawa. And uh, uh, so, when you look at uh, how we're how we're deployed, and unlike my good friend with paramedics, uh, the the funding model isn't a 50-50 split with the province. It's uh, solely uh, property taxes through. Uh, you know, from an operating budget. So we're very, very fortunate for, for the services that our volunteers offer um, offer us. And that's not just in West Harlem March, but it's also, you know, Austin, Cumberland, uh, everywhere in the rural area. So um, um, with reference to standards, you know, we still have the same standards. They're trained to the same degree, the same level, and they offer so much accountability and pride and ownership within their community. So. But certainly happy to have any questions. If there's any questions for me, uh, we have two questions. Um, fire prevention in the, in the wooded areas around the state. We haven't had a serious threat in the past few years, but we get them very honestly. And, uh, and there's a high fire hazard uh, in our communities. We live in a wooded area, you know, right next to a wooded area. We're surrounded by trees. And probably the biggest risk we face is from the forest fire. We've seen out west what's happening with climate change. So, what is the fire service doing to, to help with adaptation? What are we facing these kind of climate issues? So, that's an excellent question. And for those that may not have heard that, it's just the, uh, the wildland fires that we have are the potential within our rural areas. And I just paraphrased it a little bit. But uh, uh, the, the Ottawa Fire Service actually is well equipped from a uh, it's called the wildland or urban rural interface uh, with uh, the suppression equipment that we have to fight uh, wildland fire fighting. Uh, so uh, every uh, every piece of equipment to deal with those types of things. But I think I think you mentioned something very very important. It's the prevention, and I think you know our first two lines of our defense. Uh, number one is being prevention. So we we don't want to go to calls. So we want to try to prevent those fires. So I know there's some community groups working on it's called Fire Smart. And it's uh, it's that interface where you have um, heavily wooded areas where you know you you do that community outreach that community uh, consultation with residents and you, you just talk about how to you know properly stack firewood with a fire break away if there's leaves so there's there's a whole program and actually I know Chief Bell has reached out uh, in the community and actually in this community we've started some of that program and then we're going to continue to do it but uh, that's a very good question thanks. My question is about open air burn permits. Why do you need to have them re renewed every year annually rather than a five year gap like everything else in the holidays? Yeah, so that's, uh, so that's a great question. So open air fires and, and uh, living in a rural area myself, I, I think I'm very fortunate that I can still have an open air fire. It's, uh, and the, I think the current fee, I think it's $15 or $14, so that's very reasonable. But your question is, yeah, the renewal period. Um, the rationale for the renewal period uh, is properties change so much. I'm not saying necessarily in your case, but they change so much. So if you have to renew them, if you have to renew your permit each year, it just keeps that information current. And if you, once you get a permit, as you know, you provide all your contact information, your phone number, so if there is an event, uh, we can phone your, your address to say, listen, we just got a call, is everything okay there, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I'll certainly take that under consideration and it's something that our group can, can look at. So. Yeah, it's a bit of a nuisance. Every, pretty well every December you have to go and renew it. Yeah, and there's, a, you can go in person. We also allow the online version of, uh, if, you're, if you're able to do it online, you can renew your permit online as well with uh, service yeah. offices. I'd like to add to that. Like, this is the second time I've renewed it because I was a new resident here. Do we have an auto renew feature? 
And I were you? Yeah, because you sell the old bang every five years and just here comes the bill, you already paid it, it's 15 bucks per kind yeah. of thing. Well, sir, I can mean, I mean, see there's a yeah, we can do that tomorrow, but that's, yeah, I think that's a great, great suggestion, and we can uh, certainly take it's, that back. And it's pretty easy to do online. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. that somebody else does it for me. You, know, you, you just go online, you send them, you give them your $15, and, and, and update, you got a different phone number. So, yeah, so you're, you're right, uh, really online is quite simple, uh, but I think the suggestion may get wrong. Uh, it's just what about the automatic, just automatically remove it. Yeah, yeah. license plates are pretty easy to remove too, but I know a lot of people that got caught out because they didn't know. Yeah. What, what percentage of the, uh, of the of West Carl do you say you can cover with the zip where you can say we can get enough water equipment to have them hydrants there so we can get good insurance? Is that, can you do half that? I mean, I'm just. Is this a setup or what? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? Very, very good question. And uh, again, uh, most of the little bit here. Uh, but uh, in our rural areas of Ottawa, we have it's called the fire uh, tanker uh, shell accreditation, which is equivalent to hydrant. So, um, so if you haven't already checked with your insurance company, you can let them know that uh, we are accredited for rural tanker shell accreditation, and uh, it just means that we have the tankers, and you may have seen them, the big uh, portal tanks or the pools that. We deliver water on scene. So we have to demonstrate for three or four years that we have to demonstrate that certification that we can deliver so much water within such a period of time to get that accreditation. And, uh, and all rural parts of Ottawa does have that. Uh, uh, so all of West Carlton has that designation where we are? Yeah, all in rural Ottawa. Uh, in, in the more urban area, you can see that's not too bad to do. Yeah. Well, the rural area, there uh, obviously there's hydrants, but in the, in the rural area, uh, just with the infrastructure and the equipment that we have, we can, there's up to 16 tankers that we have of water that can shower water back and forth, so we can uh, maintain that accreditation. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. So, uh, everybody's favorite topic. Yes. 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 Fire and paramedics. I appreciate that. So uh, my name is Lennox Novak, I'm a program manager in the Defiance Services Department. Uh, so I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about the Vacant Unit Tax Program. Uh, it's been um, it's a new program that's implemented in 2023. Uh, there's been a lot of questions, I hope most of you have heard about it by now. It's been sort of part of our goal and part of the reason I'm happy to come up tonight uh, is to drum up uh, some activity around this to make sure that everybody's aware of the requirements to declare. Um, next slide. So I'll, I'll go through a, a little bit of background on the program and uh, walk you through the objectives of the program and help you understand what the requirements are for residential property owners in the city of Ottawa. Uh, I do apologize, I, didn't, uh, I was hoping the slide would be a little bit larger. Uh, had I known, I think I would have blown the text up a little bit. So the Bank Union Tax is essentially it's a new tax uh, implemented this year in 2023. It's a 1% tax that will be added to the final property tax bill for any residential property that's determined to be vacant. So that 1% tax is 1% of the property's assessed value. Uh, the objective, the reason why this program has been created, uh, it's in response to um, council declaring an affordable housing emergency in 2020. Uh, essentially, the council has staff to look at tools uh, at our disposal, disposal and see what we can do um, to address this crisis and essentially increase affordable housing in the city of Ottawa. So the Bay Unit Tax, its, it's um, objective is to change behavior of residential property owners and encourage property owners to occupy rent those properties so to make them available um, in the housing market. That's, that's the primary objective. Uh, in addition, all of the proceeds that the Bay Unit Tax generates, so all of those net proceeds are being entirely dedicated towards the port housing initiatives um, in the city, by the city, by the city hall. Uh, the declaration process is the uh, one of the key components of this new vacant unit tax. So uh, most of you would have received a notice in January. There was a notice that was sent out in November as well. Um, but essentially what the Big Unit Tax Program has introduced is this new declaration process where every year a residential homeowner has to complete a declaration to confirm how their how their property was occupied in the previous year. Um, that starts this year, so 
uh, we've, we've seen a lot of uptake, a lot of uptake in this. We received about roughly 80% of the property staff declared, so uh, we still have 20% to go. Um, so if you have not declared, I'll get more into that later as to what that process looks like. Um, in developing the program, staff, staff spent a uh, significant amount of time researching and looking at other cities, other municipalities around the world who have implemented a vacant unit tax program. Uh, we looked uh, specifically Vancouver in Canada is one of the, uh, the first municipalities to take on such a program. Um, so they looked at other options for, for how this can be done, how we can determine how a residential property is vacant. Uh, the mandatory declaration methodology was found to be the most effective uh, in addressing vacant properties, so reducing the number of vacant properties out there, and in um, increasing the drive and revenues from that. Uh, so that, that was the recommended option, that's the uh, backbone of the vacant unit tax program in Ottawa. If you don't complete your declaration, the property is deemed vacant. So that's a critical component, and that's why, part, partly why I'm here tonight, I want to make sure, I want to make sure that it's known. Uh, that's the last thing that we want. When we come to deadline March 16th, we want to make sure that we receive declarations and that we don't have anyone caught uh, unaware of this new requirement to complete your declaration. So who has to complete a declaration? So it's residential property owners for properties that hold up to six units. So. Um, it's the, the municipal act, the provincial legislation will give the city the authority to implement this program uh, and will basically allow it to administer it for properties up to six units. So it does not include multiple residential properties. Um, how we determine which properties are included in the program is from the is, is done by the uh, data collected by the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. So you may have heard of NPAC, these are the, uh, this is the provincial entity that comes around, they do uh, assessments for primarily for property tax purposes, so when Cyril talked a little bit about growth and assessment, uh, impact are the folks who are gathering that data and determining assessments, uh, evaluation of certain properties. So they also assign a property code to a value, and that's um, how we determine if a property is residential for the purposes of the making a tax program. There's been a few questions that have come up, especially uh, in this board around uh, property classification, and have a residential unit or not. So uh, later on, I'll provide some contact information, but I would encourage anyone who has questions about their property, how it fits with the vacant unit tax program to reach out. Um, we've got a team that's, been de that's dedicated to respond and, and uh, walk you through that process. So if you received a notice in January, uh, that means that your property needs to declare. So the, the notice would have given you uh, your property roll number, an access code, those are essentially your keys to complete that declaration. So the deadline, as I mentioned, is March 16th, so just over a month away. Um, coming up quick. How do you make your declaration? So primarily online is the uh, is the method to go. So on auto.ca, we've got a form. You go to auto.ca slash BUT. Uh, there's a form that you can fill out there. Uh, you can also access it through your MySource Auto account. So if you don't have a MySource Auto account, you can log in there. You can get all your tax bills, your water bills. Um, well, if you have a water account. Um, there's a few other services there as well. The nice thing with MySource Auto, if you associate your property tax account to it, it's, you never have to find your roll number or your access code again. Uh, it's always there. So that's, that, that is, eliminates one step in completing that declaration. Uh, the form is accessible and you can do it on your phone and your tablet. Uh, it truly takes you know, a couple minutes, uh, less than five minutes I would say to complete. So you can do that on your phone uh, fairly quickly as well. Next slide. Uh, for those who don't have access to the internet or who may need support with completing the declaration, you can also call in. Um, so we do accept declarations over the phone as well. So if you call in at 613-580-2444, we've got a dedicated line Press three if you want to skip the, uh, the, the verbiage, and you'll reach a team that can uh, answer your questions if you have any questions or help you complete your declaration. Um, as well, we can send you a paper form, so you can call that number, we'll mail out a paper form if you'd like to take a look at it. Uh, and as well, you can come in and book an appointment at the Revenue Services counter, which is that side of the constellation, if you want to come in and actually speak to someone about your property and that declaration process. 
Uh, I've got a few slides to put together just to give you a, a feel. I, I imagine uh, if you're included in the program, I hope that you can read your declaration. If you haven't, this will give you a little bit of a sense of, of what that step looks like, what those steps look like. So um, on the screen here, a little difficult to make out, but these are the two access points that I had mentioned online. On the left is auto.ca slash BUT, and on the right is my service audio. That's that online dashboard. You can get your tax, your tax bills there as well. Slide. So first step of the declaration form uh, is the property search. So two keys to complete the form are your roll number and your access code. And those can be found on that letter that was sent out in January or on your property tax code. Quick point on that. There's a thread on the Community Association Facebook page with a bunch of people. They're having to go and input it because the community is capital L, <laughs> yeah. small L, and capital I, capital I is the same. Yeah. So is it that's true. rejecting a ticket or not? Too long. Uh, and that's, yeah, and that's, so we have that up um, as well, and that's a, a, a trend that came up. So capital, if you have an issue, if you're if you, it says property not found when you're doing this. If you have an O, a zero, um, a one, an L, those are getting mistaken. That's feedback that we're taking, unfortunately, and, and hoping to address moving forward. Uh, regardless, those codes are, are, are the code that you need to input this year. So if you do have that issue, just try swapping those characters. Um, that's a common one that we've come across. And when I mention MyService Ottawa, if you do it through MyService Ottawa, you never have to do that again. That whole step's gone. Next step is contact information. So here we just ask you to give us your, your name, and email, and phone number. This is the contact information for who's complete, whoever's completing the declaration. This is so that we can contact you if we need any additional information. Uh, the third step, again, too small to make out, but apologies for that. Uh, this is the occupancy detail. So this is the meat of the declaration. Uh, this is really where you're telling us how your property was occupied. On the left, um, it's as simple as a single drop down. If your property, if you're using your property as your primary residence, this is where you live, this is where you conduct your daily affairs, um, you would simply tell us this is your primary residence, and that's it. That's all we need from you. On the right hand side, uh, is I'm showing you what it would look like if your property was tenanted. So if you own multiple properties, so you're leasing them out, you're, you're renting them out, you need to indicate that it's occupied by a tenant, and then also include the start date and the end date for. Uh, when they occupied that unit in the last year. We don't need to know um, if they're the duration of their lease, just within the last year we were occupied for the full year. Uh, that's what we need you to input there. So for, for a tenant who's maybe there year over year, it would simply be January 1st to December 31st. Uh, next steps are our summary page. So this one's uh, fairly straightforward. It's going to just reiterate what you input on the screen and give you a chance you have to confirm that everything you input is true and accurate, and then click Submit to submit your declaration. Next slide, and that's it. So this is the confirmation page with the confirmation ID. Um, you'll receive an email as well, confirming that we've received your, your declaration. Uh, that's, that's the declaration process. So it, it, is, it is fairly straightforward, it is very quick. Um, and uh, yeah, there, are, there are some exemptions, so on that third step where you're giving us your occupancy details, I'm sort of uh, simplifying to represent, I think, the bulk of uh, property owners, the, part, the path that they'll go through. However, for some folks, they may fall under a different category. Um, so there are exemptions that exist. On that third step, you would have to say, uh, how have my property occupied in the previous year? You would select none of the above. You'll be presented with an option to select an exemption. Um, uh, and there are, these are the exemptions that exist. So if, if there was a death of the registered owner, that is an exemption. Uh, if the property owner was in the hospital or a long-term care facility during that year. Uh, if the property was sold, this is a common one. So if the property was sold during that year, um, the property is exempt from the vacant unit tax program and all you have that transfer of ownership. Uh, if there's a court order or a government order prohibiting occupancy or sale uh, of the property, if the property is undergoing extended renova extensive renovations or constructions, which would prohibit the occupancy of the property, and then lastly, if the property is used as a cottage rental with a valid permit for at least 100 days in the year. So those are the exemptions that you can select on that form. There are uh, some, a little bit of information that can be required for each, so that gives you a, a bit of a sense of um, what options exist for property owners. Next slide. 
So I hope that wasn't too quick, but that, that's just in a nutshell uh, what that program, what this program uh, is, is, is meant to do and, and sort of the requirements for property owners out there. Looking ahead, uh, March 16th is the deadline. If you know of anyone who, who is having or asked questions, who's, who's maybe not sure what to do, I, I would really encourage them to either call us at 580-2444. Um, you know, we were quite busy in the first week, first couple weeks of January. It was uh, uh, very, you know, unfortunately we had to some wait time on that phone uh, on the phone number, but these days you can get in, uh, fortunately, without having to wait. So we'll get to you very quickly and we'll walk you through the questions you may have. Yes. Um, I filled my house, but uh, my question is: It seems like an awful lot of effort on the part of you know, those million people in Ottawa yeah. to have a, uh, this forum. In particular, I don't know what the percentage is of principal uh, residents. Yeah. Could this not just be it, number one included in a tax billing cycle, so you would get to, you would do it at the same time as you as you pay your taxes each year. And but more particularly for people where it is, you are the principal, it is your principal residence. Yeah. You just take a box off. Yeah. Because you're not interested in those people anyway. So I, I, I can understand that, and that is feedback that you have. So we are capturing the feedback. Um, I'll explain to you why we end up with this model and, and the reason for the declaration process. Okay, but let me, just to clarify, I'm not yeah. talking so much about the first pass at it. Yeah. But this is going to happen every year. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, we're going to be getting tax bills every year. Well, I can't just get the box off and say, yeah, this is my principal revenue. If it isn't, then you might go ahead and do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, part of the challenge, part of the reason for the push for online is to, to reduce the cost of administering this program, right? This program, in order for this program to be effective, um, it needs to operate fairly lean um, and generate revenue that goes towards the residents. So that, that is um, one of the factors at play. If we were to introduce a checkbox, some kind of mailback you know, process in the property tax bill, to process all of that would be, uh, which would have pretty significant costs to go, to go with it. So that, that was partially why that, that was done. Um, and, and just looking ahead at the path ahead, this is a new program for the city. Uh, the city council is very interested in this program in terms of uh, how it's performed, what the impact is. So the city staff are committed, um, our team is committed to um, communicating uh, regularly with council providing data on on the program, um, declarations, vacancy, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and most importantly, in 2024, giving us giving a first report in terms of what what did, what would the impact of this program? You know, how did it reduce the number of vacant units uh, in the city? Um, what, what types of revenue did it drive? Um, you know, really evaluating, looking at the methodology of the program. You said we have 80% response to the uh, vacant uh, tax bill. Do you have any early numbers that you could share with us in terms of how many are vacant and uh, any anticipated uh, revenue coming from the program? Sure. I don't have any numbers that I can share with you today in terms of what data we collected. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that from uh, our projections and the analysis that went into developing this program, it was based on a, a vacancy rate of 0.5%. Chad, up to you. Do you recall how many properties are Well, it roughly equated to about 1,653. <laughs> I just have to remember this that number. Uh, it lasts quite a bit um, units. And we, we based that you know, off of um, understanding um, what the you know, general vacancy rate is, what properties might be considered uh, exempt. So what is you know what we might consider as vacant, and you might hear you know CMHC quote rates of you know vacancy in Ottawa is two or three percent. You know why are we not generating more you know more than that? And that's because you know, properties some properties are you know being renovated, some properties are being sold. Um, so we use Vancouver as our model um, because they have had this program for five years now, and we can kind of see what kind of numbers they generate. So based on their performance and um, consulted with uh, other municipalities that are you know, facing the same issues and see what best practices were. And we, um, sorry, I can't see you. You're, you're going, I'm hearing it, so I can use your voice for you. Yeah. Carry around a microphone for the audience. Yeah, so I, I can ramp it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, we, we based it on 0.5. We, we thought it was conservative um, when we 
uh, initially proposed it, but we wanted to have realistic uh, revenue projections so that we can say, you know what, these numbers will generate funds for affordable housing, because if it doesn't, um, then it's not a worthwhile program. So, well, and, and, and we want to see the numbers reduce, right? So, ultimately, we want these units to move into the housing market, right? And increase, you know, this is one factor, it's not going to be a magical solution, but it's one factor, one tool that we have at our disposal to hopefully improve the conditions in our Speaking of Vancouver, we will aim to increase uh, the bid to property tax, uh, I think they're up to those five or seven percent now. They recently could be up to five percent. So they, they actually charge five percent of the property's assessed value. Um, I, I can't comment on that necessarily. Okay. I think that's something that will, that's a conversation that may, you know, may occur. As I mentioned, next year we'll do our report looking back at the previous <laughs> program. The city of Toronto has also uh, had, has launched a similar program in 2023. Um, so it's, it's something that's gaining momentum, especially in Ontario. Not to the program, sir. Yes. So I have two questions. One, sure. <clears throat> your presentation was, was well done. Mm -hmm. um, it seems somewhat cumbersome in terms of the process. Mm -hmm. And so have you done a cost benefit analysis in terms of the revenue stream coming in from this 1% mm -hmm. to the cost of running this program? And if that is determined that there is no benefit to it, whose ultimate decision is it? Is the council's decision to walk away from mm -hmm. what I will say is a very poor decision for a cost for the, for the taxpayers in terms of negative billing? Right. We've heard all across Canada about the outrage from people about negative billing for, for cable services or phone services, which is just puts the consumer on the hook, mm -hmm. putting the onus on us, right? Um, the city has a large infrastructure, and I think it's somewhere within that infrastructure, you should be able to find the resources to track the vacant land. Yeah. You have you have bylaw, you have other services that you could be utilizing, and yet you decided not to go to that, and you automatically went to a negative billing option. So, whose decision is it to reverse that uh, that that policy? Should we determine that you're not getting any revenue and you're spending more than uh, than what you're bringing in? Hey, what things happen? No, sure. Yeah. So, so effectively, the program what we're projecting for 2023 is. A net of four point four million dollars in revenue going right to affordable housing. So that that projection will be reported back to the program in May for the actual internals, but not the actual units. Yep. So that is net yeah. new <laughs> revenue coming in towards affordable housing, which you know council council's original direction was okay. Staff come forward with innovative ways or new ways of revenue stream without putting the burden on the taxpayer. Yes, you would now have to do it now that we have built that exercise. Whether it takes a minute or a couple minutes, the onus is kind of up to you in the scenario. I agree with that. Draw a review that was done before we came back to that report. We reviewed various cities from Australia to Vancouver to what they've done. This was the most effective way in terms of their cost benefit, in terms of utilizing the best revenue stream, the net revenue stream. And having a declaration there. There's so many privacy laws in terms of what we can do at the city in terms of water bill privacy and all that stuff that we don't really have. Logically, you would think that we should be able to go to the city and say, hey, this resident didn't use any water this year, so it must be paid. But we don't have the ability to do that because of different privacy laws and all of their stuff. So we're really, I'm not trying to be wishy washy, but we're kind of restricted to what we can do in terms of the cost of the box. So with all that review that's here, that's the decision that we went for, and that's the decision that council uh, agreed to. That was the last one. When we go back and we're not report, if depending on the council at the table and the results of this program after a year, they have full will to change the policy or do something different depending on what we can report back to. And do we have any numbers on the administrative costs to run this program? So right now, uh, so right now, why don't you check that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just pull some numbers off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, in, in the report council, when the council approved it, they, they approved the program to run with a specific cost, right? So um, in 2020, in year one, uh, we have a projected cost of 1.6 million. Uh, over the course of the first five years, it's approximately 1.4 million per year. Um, in costs and revenues are approximately six million. 
projected. So over the course of the first five years, the net gain to the city would be, I believe, 25, 25 million, I think, uh, 25 million, which is all net new money, money and revenue going towards the court of housing issues. And so of course, we turn our council. Yeah, well, five, 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 five years. Over five years. Basically, are you going to be looking at reviewing it after you want? Yeah, so we are, we're, we're going back this year with a report in terms of what the declarations were, how many units were actually taken, and what that is. Uh, and from there, I'm sure we'll probably get a direction from that again midway through the term, maybe. Uh, but we're definitely going to report back the results. Okay, back this. Yeah. Um, yeah, you were talking about the interim report, I guess. Uh, I understand that you are to report back to council before June. Yeah, the interim the 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 Yeah, so we have we, we committed to provide some key data this year. So in May and October, we'll be providing some key updates to council that will really give them a sense of uh, where the program is trending. Um, you know, the update and the by from the public. However, uh, the, the program has some other components to it, so I didn't go into it in detail, but there's an appeal process as well, right, which is, which is important to make sure that that's there, as well as there's an audit process as well. So those are two key, two key components that need to run, they need some time to run. So our first full report, in terms of the effectiveness of year one of the Disney impact, will be going in 2024. But, but in, in terms of reporting, in between there, so you got to appreciate, to be honest, you got to go through a cycle to really evaluate the program. <laughs> yeah. Check in, if you will, or that please. But, but you'll you probably have a pretty good idea once you get everybody who has reported it, mm -hmm. then you'll have a pretty good idea what your uh, numbers of vacant units are. So you can match that to what your projections are. Uh, yeah, the projections. Yeah. Yes, first, uh, I think your staff have done a good job implementing what council has asked you to do, so congratulations on that. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I think I agree with the consensus of what I've heard here. It's a hell of a lot of trouble. It's not two minutes, as you suggested. It's two days on the phone trying to do a bunch of properties. Mm -hmm. because, and the answer from council was, well, we haven't got all that stuff posted on the internet just yet. Mm -hmm. And so, it, <laughs> It ain't easy, and it may save you a couple of million dollars, which costs us a lot in, in filling that friggin' form out. Yeah. And, I, and I just say, in terms of the objective, I say to you, uh, Councillor, that you can't scare people by, by one percent. Maybe if you get up to five or ten percent, you can scare people into renting your house. You would, your efforts would be far better directed at the problem and say, Pick your backsides in here and have a, a quick appeal process for people who don't pay rent. So that scares the jeepers out of, of somebody who's, who has a, a new house and they say, oh, I don't, I've heard all those horror stories about what happens when you rent. Mm -hmm. And that's that's your real challenge. It isn't uh, trying to frighten people into renting uh, because you're going to charge them one and a half percent. If they have to pay $1,500, they will. Maybe if you boost it up enough, you can uh, scare them a bit, but they probably just sell. But if does then put maybe a house on the market. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, those are, are my experiences. Yeah. It's a hell of a lot of trouble if you've got many units to do. And and, yeah, uh, I heard that and, and yeah. perhaps yeah. next year will be better because we'll know it. And our only final review came out when your department uh, sent out something that exempt. Uh, <coughs> You're doing what your bosses have asked, and congratulations on that. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I assume that as this program is streamlined, uh, the education ranks down because everyone's so used to it within a couple of years of the final program, yeah. that the operating costs will decrease year over year? I, I hope so. I, okay. I, I, That's I, 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 I'll be honest. I think I personally was a little taken aback by the uh, uptake in the years, at least one, week two. Uh, I didn't just say that. Uh, well, yeah, the website is down for the first two days or something. I tried, it just like I get it. Yeah, it, I totally understand. So like, I feel so okay. But uh, January sixteenth, we kind of hit our halfway point. 
So within two weeks of going live, we, you know, half the people in Ottawa that we need to declare, declare. Um, you know, whether, and, you know, thankfully we did have an online program. Um, our phone lines were jammed and, I mean, you know, we, we tried our best, but, I mean, unfortunately, we, um, you know, that many people are, you know, following our, our letters and, and yeah. we're not just to declare, which is a good thing. And we wanted the attention, so it was good, but it, yeah, it got you. So that's so right. so right. something that you know, yeah. were really expensive. I've done some marketing. <laughs> they, they are, are. Yeah. And this is something that they're talking about. It's happening to be more efficient going forward, knowing that there are a, a, a percentage of the population that I think will understand the requirement and there are other channels to, to, to make that up. Yeah, Sir Pazzo was world great for reminding like, reminded me that I <laughs> renewed my entire life. Yeah. 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 And I think that hopefully the public will pick up on the fact that if you do have until March 16th, you don't have to call on, on January 4th or January 5th. Um, realize how quick and easy it is once you do get through, um, that perhaps you know they, they might uh, you know, help, help themselves out from, from not having to wait so long. But I mean, we do acknowledge that the, the times were, were long and we, you know, we do encourage people to go online to, to make it happen. But um, you know, that's a lesson learned. Question back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just um, just for fun, um, yeah. if I have a baby unit yeah. and it's assessed at uh, say half a million, five hundred sure. thousand dollars, and it's vacant, what would I retain? Seventy-five thousand dollars charge. Sorry. Five thousand. Five thousand. Five thousand. One percent of that thousand. That's a hefty fee. It is. It's been. I think it comes to kind of follow up on the comments from earlier. In Vancouver, we did see an increase of rate, and, and I think it depends on the behavior change, right? Ultimately, this program is about behavior change, and we need to see some of these big things. And, and from the conversations I've had, you know, I am hearing from people who have been sitting on properties, sort of not doing anything, um, and now taking action. So we're, we're coming up to five minutes left in the scheduled session. I'm, I'm certainly happy to stay a little later and, and chat with anyone who wants to talk further. So I'll go, let's go five more minutes on making unit tax. Sure. Uh, and then Cyril, we can wrap up the consultation and yeah. you guys can get out of here and if there's <coughs> any more comments, concerns, or things you want to ask. Can we get an opportunity to talk about priorities of how you're spending money in the, in the budget? Yeah, so let's, if anyone has any more questions on baking unit tabs, ask them now and then we can let them go. And absolutely, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about priorities. Before we just yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, from here for the next thing. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So, just, yeah, just put it in perspective, how many uh, residential properties are we talking about? So, the total uh, scope is 323,000. Approximately this year, 323,000. Okay, perfect. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. My second comment is just thank you all for coming out tonight yeah. oh, and, and supporting the counselor. I think it's a great initiative to have that and that. Yeah. To have all of the staff come out from the city, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice to see yeah. support uh, the entire scope of this. Uh, of this After two years of virtual sessions, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. First in person session, session is quite awesome. You, you mentioned the appeal process. Would you be sure to, 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 to emphasize that that cost you two hundred fifty bucks? So get it done on time. Yeah. You, you may not be able to say it as cruelly as that, but. <laughs> and this year there is no late fee, but next year there will be. Yeah, oh, there's no fee this year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, now I have a concern about the inclusion of farm properties. Yeah. In that, I have a farm property. Okay. Farm property. And there's two parts to that farm. Okay. It's got a house which I rent, I don't live in the property anymore. Okay. I have that. I have outbuildings which I use myself. And I have arable land that I rent out. Okay. So there's three parts to that property. And the, the, the assessment I have only gives a market value assessment for the whole property, 100 acres. And the house is, they used, to, they used to give on the assessments the residential value and the farm property, the agricultural value. They don't do that anymore. But the house is, when they did do it, the house is in the neighborhood of about a third of the total value. So the question is, if, if I decide not to rent the house at some point in the future, mm -hmm. okay, if you apply that one percent tax, mm -hmm. do you apply it to the total value, mm -hmm. or do you apply it to the value of the house? And if so, how do you get the value of the house? Because if you apply it to the whole value, 
you're talking in my case about 2% tax, and everybody else is paying 1%. Right. So I don't like to see the firms in the whole thing. I don't think it fits. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a split uh, in residential class and farm class. So if your property has farm land, it should. So I mean, we see it on our end. I'm not sure if you see it on the tax bill that part. You, you, so you should be able to see this I'm going to narrow you one, okay, which is one of your your farm property type. Yeah. Okay. So. I fill it out, the house is rented, that's okay. But if it's not rented, and you want to apply the tax to it, mm -hmm. where do you apply? Because I've got the land rented, it's been rented for years. Yeah. It's only to the residential portion, so the, the house portion of the property. So how do you get so that? If you say, they, well, I, I don't know your particular scenario. Well, the bylaw doesn't say that, that's the whole thing. No, oh, so it, it's on the R, so there's a, the RT portion, essentially a residential tax class. When you look at total property assessment, You'll see an FT, uh, a different tax class portion, FT, RT, FT, farm, RT, res. So it would be just on the RT component. But and this is for, for an individual like, um, property. This is where I, I would say I would urge you, if, if you don't mind, you know, fire up an email. If you, if you mention it for here tonight, I'm more than happy to pick it up. Um, just knowing you know, the time we have, and, and, and we, can, we can look into that. So you're not clear in the bylaw. It specifies, I believe it specifies residential tax class, I think. I think. Yeah. Can read it right now. Or? Yeah, maybe 12, 30 pounds, or maybe. Yeah, it's another option. So I'm more than happy to look into it more, but. <laughs> any, any other questions on, uh, on the new tax program? No. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Sir, did you have anything else you wanted to uh, present, or did you guys want to? I know there's a couple of questions on various topics. Yeah, feel free to just a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody else present? But there's a lot of questions. Fire away. Yes. I just wanted to bring up my disappointment at how much money was being put towards the climate. Um, the climate plan that the city has come up with. They have as they have set aside five million dollars, which is the first time you've had a set amount of funds applied to the job, but that's point one percent of the budget. And the uh, climate evolution calls for a need of more like sixty-five million, which is still less than one point five percent. So we have a climate emergency in Ottawa. We're not putting funds toward it. We're, we're losing the opportunity to be able to have an effective plan. Um, they were able to find 72 million for potholes at the tail end of the last budget. So there, there's got to be a way for us to prioritize the climate at a higher rate than the five million units in a uh, Sarah will know the, the details on, on this more than I would, but I would rather suggest that it's actually much higher than that when you factor in like things like the electric cost per unit, which is yes, nine hundred million dollar per unit. Yeah, I'm talking about the climate, your climate evolution, the climate evolution plan, and it needs yeah. a certain amount of funds. So I'm talking about that in particular. Plus a certain side of the course. Yeah, so that five million is, is a direct investment to continue work to enhance on that strategy and that strategy in the city. We're still working through the evolution of that and that strategy. But you also need to consider to kind of point the last week down so through the investment for that zero emission budget to like the process, which is mainly funded by provincial grant or federal grants of 350 million. So that is the biggest contribution into the city's goals as far as climate change from an investment perspective. Transportation is huge. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the biggest ones there. In the budget, we've also identified for the first time, again, it's a little bit vague as it's going through, but we've also identified all the capital projects in the budget, in the budget that do have a direct impact, positive impact and contribution to climate change and additional 54 million or so with a moderate to high impact in reducing PhD and then impacting uh, 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 action standards in terms of improving the city's uh, climate change goals. So that five million is just one component of a direct investment into that, that team and that strategy. There's many, 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 many,
But when you talk to the climate team at the city, they're not being allocated the funds they need to do their job. So how do you answer to them? So again, it comes back to balance, right? So, so, yeah. so I'm saying I think the balance is a bit skewed. We've got a climate emergency. We don't have a roads emergency. I mean, we, we have a need for roads. But when are we going to put the money behind what we're saying? So again, that goes back to term council priorities. So, so I'm saying, please, Mr. Councillor, will you take the message to the council that we're, we're losing the, the, the balls rolling away from us here? Well, the last thing we came here to do tonight is listen to priorities from, from people. I, as I said in my opening statements, my positions are informed by you guys. So I know there's a, a range of opinions in the room, particularly on, on how we tackle climate change. And I, I think that's also part of the process, right? Like, where do we invest that money? How do we invest it? What are the projects we invest it in? And then when we discuss our priorities as a council, that will all be discussed. Well, they do have a plan, and they do have an assessment. There's a fabulous document out there as to what the plan was and what's been accomplished and what hasn't. So we know when, where we're falling behind. Well, I, I would rather, I guess, that every individual team within the city of Ottawa who has their initiatives wants more money to do more with what they are doing. But that is one, and I know it's something you feel passionately about it. It is a, a challenge, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that we all need to work on. But there's a roads department, there's a pair of, there's paramedics, there's fire. Like there are things we all need to think about and, and that is certainly one of them. And, and I would think that regardless of what department you ask in the city of Ottawa, they would want more money to implement their plan. So what does the rating of a climate emergency and a housing emergency do for you if it doesn't put you up a little higher tier than the other needs that are coming up? I, I think that's a discussion that we need to have and it's, it's going to be a difficult one. Um, I think it needs to be talked about more. I haven't heard much coming out of the city um, saying we're going to ramp this up, we have a plan for 10 years, we're going to put this amount in. We need a vision in the city to be better than we are now. Yeah. Um, like I said, that's a, that's a conversation we are having constantly, uh, I believe, and, and doing a universal program review and seeing where the city is spending money and how much we're willing to raise taxes and where we're going to make from. Like I said, it's a, it's a balance. And some people feel extremely passionately about investing more money in initiatives to tackle climate change. And again, I do think that's important. But other people have other priorities. And, and as elected officials, we have to listen to all of that and balance it and, and find ways to address the issues and I think it goes well beyond the particular team at the city of Ottawa. It's our transportation, it's our, you know, all of our departments have a role to play in that. And I, I think we have some very smart people at the city on that team who, who have some ambitious goals. And as a councillor, I definitely want to achieve those goals. I, I see the news, I see the floods, I see the tornadoes, I see the temperatures rising globally. Like, I, I know it's an issue, but it's not the only issue. And that's the challenge for us at the council table when we set our priorities. So One point that five. team wants more money. I would love to give them more money, but where is it coming from? Yeah. And that's just, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm not, I'm not opposing your position on it. I do think it's important. But there's a, a bigger conversation to be had, and there's lots of viewpoints and, and initiatives and ways to test it. I, I, I want to do better. And, um, more than happy to sit with you in my office and chat about what you'd like to see and, and how much you'd like to see spent in there. Yeah, 0.1% of the budget seems a little bit skinny. I will pass them to the one. But this is, this is not, I, I, I think your idea of incorporating the broader discussion into the program review is a good idea. Because this is one of this overarching all encompassing issues, but it's not something that's come out of the blue. I mean, Ottawa declared a, a climate emergency in 2019, and then they developed two documents which you referred to earlier, which are the ways to accomplish and address the climate emergency, both through mitigation, 
production of GHGs and adaptation to the climate that we've already that we've already seen. And within those two documents, there are something like 159 milestones that, that the council has already determined they want to meet, but aren't. And so our position is, given the urgency and given that the Ottawa Council has acknowledged we are in a climate crisis and developed an overall master plan, we would like to see more progress, more specifics, and additionally, more transparency and more information about what's actually happening. Because this is a big problem. People don't know. They don't know how the other projects that you're incorporating climate perspectives in, how it all comes together, what the overall vision is. Well, I think the city needs to do a better job at attaching our budget initiatives to those documents, to the to those guiding documents that we have as a city, and then I've spoke to people in this room yeah. about that. And you're right, I think we need to be better at aligning the priorities with the budget. And you know, and I'm sure Cyril can see how complicated it is to put together a five billion dollar budget and, and fund all of those initiatives. And uh, yeah, it's I, I know we need to improve on on we, we spend so much time talking and coming up with those documents and those initiatives and then we get the draft budget and, and it's hard to tie one to the other. And I, and I think easy. if we could all do that, you know, I'd be better off if we were more easily able to tie those two things together. It's easy to comprehend potholes. Yeah. And how if you don't fix it now it's gonna be worse. Right. But climate change is of a different order. And it needs a different set of processes to for all of us, and not just the city council, but all of the groups in the city who work on climate issues, who have to be part of the solution, because the city itself, as you have already indicated, needs to collaborate with the feds and with the province, and also with community organizations who are going to be the ones that help to carry out a lot of that work. So in the next review of your program, that this vision, which you have already developed, needs to be further refined. Because we, we, we're supposed to have been further along. We're three years into this now since the climate emergency was declared in Ottawa. Other cities are further ahead of us. So we need to... Well, you know what, I'm, I'm going into all of this. I'd love to hear the specifics of what you want on and I'd be happy to take that information back to the city and talk to the, you know, the departments and officials that, that I need to talk to to get the right information to see how we right. present those issues. So yes, we by all means, yes. we we send me the details and I'll look at it. But you know, I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, I'm not an engineer. Yet. So and neither am I, <coughs> you know, I'm just a citizen. <laughs> but but we're learning. And it does concern all of us, whether well, we're fine. So well, I, I think it concerns me as well. And I, like you said, I think it, it's going to take a whole city approach to tackle the edge. Right. And the yeah. yeah, just a, a few quick comments on the roads budget. Yeah. We're getting rather late. Uh, you mentioned the figure of 136 million going into roads, but we've also heard reference made to a gap. Well, in reality, the gap in road maintenance continues to be about as large as the allocation of, uh, of the budget. It's been that way since amalgamation, and that's why the roads are in the terrible condition uh, that they are. Uh, I'll be giving a presentation to the Transportation <coughs> Committee uh, on the budget uh, later on in the, uh, in the month. Uh, I have been encouraged by the last budget of uh, Mayor Watson uh, when he said we'd listen to the people and they put significant additional money into the budget. I was intrigued uh, during the, uh, the last campaign when uh, the current mayor had as a platform item, he wanted to put a hundred million into a special program for a four year period to help overcome this gap. Well, of that a hundred million, we see one million in this budget. So I don't know how we're going to get 
the other 99 million uh, in the uh, in the term of the budget. So my recommendation to transportation committee is to go back to the mayor and say, you made us a promise of 100 million. We'd like to see a quarter of that for the first year. So I'll be recommending 25 million dollar addition to the, uh, the roads renewal budget. Just for clarity, there is a plan for money. So there, there's one million for these uh, road maintenance, is a million dollars for minor sidewalk repairs, and there's a one-time additional thirty million in this budget to capture in terms of the budget. Hard to see that from the budget because we need that simple explanation to the residents. What exactly do you consider roads renewal? So because when I look at the figures uh, in the documentation, it shows <coughs> road renewal. 2021, Road Renewal 2022, and 2023, and comparing them, we're getting 136 this year compared to 135 last year. Yeah, because last year, in 2022, there's a one-time $39 million increment. That was a one-time. So apples to apples, really, yes, from a year over year, 135 million. No, so apples, apples to apples, apples million, 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 what, what roads million. are going to be renewed, and what is the value of that? So the rural renewal resurfacing budget is in the transportation committee, 90172 project maybe, uh, $74 million earmarked for rural resurfacing and the rural service there. I'll send you a note so you can get some clarification before I go to the transportation committee because there's, there's nothing more difficult than to go to a committee and find that staff is giving different information to the committee than was given to the, uh, to the public. So, uh, so just for clarification, whatever information I get from the public is the information in the budget book, but I don't get that information from the sources, so just for that clarification. Any additional thoughts? More call. Okay. It's getting late. It's not a lot of work. Sure, Yes, I just want to say thank you very, very much for this uh, discussion. I think it was very good. And uh, I think it's also a sign that we can have discussions like this. I think it's great. I'm uh, looking forward to it will be the first of a second era uh, committee meeting. Uh, the very first one is next week, right? Okay. The 24th. The 24th. Okay. Um, now, just a question. Do you still have open mind? You know? Yeah, so public delegations are open to the So that's there. Yes, I know, but your act was a little bit different in the sense that you could come, you could do a walk around. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the same. I don't recall. I don't recall the change, but I'm going to follow up with your act. Okay, and thank you to all the staff. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Um, this is more of a comment, but it goes back to this kind of discussion. Um, so you're so sorry. Anyone who wants to leave, including the Ward 5 team, feel free to leave. <laughs> and also, I'd like to note that we have the board summary for the budget, and you can grab a copy of it. Next year, we're an opportunity, we'll give that to you on the <laughs> So, uh, I comment, there's a lot of new councils, as you pointed out, on council, yeah. and a lot of uh, people were elected with the hope that this council would be better than the last one. The last one sat on the stage for a bunch of issues, and we're happy to see some of those people among us, but the people who are here now, we're looking for you guys to move on things. And I have every hope that this council will, will be able to deliver in a more positive uh, way to get more things done for people. We're watching. That's our expectation. Yeah. Well, I think that's council's expectation. And, and we, we all have differences around the council table. But at the end of the day, we go back to talking to each other. We don't let the fact that I didn't call this so and so or, or never to get in the way of those bigger conversations. By the way, so your staff did a great job. Yes, they did. As they always do.